Okay, welcome again, everybody, for those of uh, you who just got on. Um, I am very excited to be able to have our guests join us today for this community lunch hour where we're focusing on uh, an exhibit through Portage County Historical Society that's uh, been ongoing, opened last summer uh, over at Heritage Park and getting some of the stories on the focus of that exhibit, which is women in athletics and um, the um, Title IX legislation and changes that have been made through the decades um, with participation in sports uh, for women. I'm really excited for our, our guests. Uh, Sue Kale joins us. She's a longtime community volunteer for the Portage County Historical Society, as well as the Stevens Point YMCA and Pacelli Catholic Schools. She has worked on exhibits, books, and presentations for World War I and World War II for the Historical Society, in addition to her work on the Title IX Committee, which is what we're gonna be talking about today. She and her husband, Paul, are proud Portage County residents and strong supporters of many organizations in their communities. Thank you so much for joining us, Sue. We also have John Harry, who's the Executive Director of the Portage County Historical Society. Prior to this role, John has enjoyed a 10-year career as a radio personality, working all over the country, including right here in central Wisconsin. And I think that all started even at the UWSP 90FM, right, John? Yep. Um, awesome. He holds a bachelor's degree from that school, UWSP, in communications and a master's in history and graduate certificate in nonprofit management from UW-Milwaukee along with public history work experience with the Milwaukee County Historical Society, with the Pabst Mansion Museum, and the Smithsonian's Institute, uh, Smithsonian's Natural Museum of American History. And then we have a special guest, Sheila Mish, who is joining us from Florida. But before I get into her long bio, because she's gonna be doing some storytelling for us today, I wanted to give us a little bit of context for why we're all here. Um, as you all are aware, every month, or every, uh, month the Community Foundation holds these Monday community lunch hours. And it's an opportunity for us to investigate what's happening in our community. And we wanted to take uh, this month to highlight uh, the work that is being done over at the Port Portage County Historical Society. Um, there is an exhibit currently um, at the Heritage Park that focuses on women in athletics, that history of Portage County in central Wisconsin and uh, what it is uh, to look back at Title IX legislation from the 1970s onto today and how that has affected women in sports. To get us started, um, I wanted to have Sue Kale um, talk to us a little bit about Title IX and overview and brief history of that legislation. Sue. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you for inviting us to be part of this. We're really excited. Um, First of all, on June 23rd in 1972, Title IX, or the Amendment of the Higher Education Act, was passed by Congress and signed into law by President Richard Nixon. Representative Patsy Mink of Hawaii is recognized as a major author and sponsor of the bill, and perhaps you've not heard of her before, but hopefully after today you'll remember her name. In 2002, the act was renamed the Patsy T. Mink, Equal Opportunity in Education Act. The 37 words that I think we've all heard a number of times um, in, the, in the 50 year celebration of Title IX, this law that changed opportunities for women, it's just tremendous. No person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Powerful words indeed. And powerful words from, a, from um, a powerful woman, Patsy Mink. She was a trailblazer herself, just like Sheila. Um, she was the first woman of color and the first Asian American woman elected to Congress. She originally had her sights set on medical school, um, but was not accepted, um, likely because of race. Um, so she went to law school, graduating from the University of Chicago. After law school, she tried to get a job with um, some of the major firms. And because she was married and already had a child, she was not able to secure employment. So then she turned her attention to politics. And for the rest of her career, 
She worked tirelessly to eliminate barriers um, for, of opportunity for women and people of color. So indeed, well, well named to rename Title IX, the legislation in her honor. Um, this weekend, I was found some old magazines and perhaps you remember Life Magazine. This is the final issue of Life Magazine, the year in pictures, published December 29th, 1972. I went through the whole magazine. Title IX was not even a ripple in the magazine's um, history and notable events, although we certainly believe it was a notable event. But they did mention one, they had a couple mentions of women athletes, and one of them being Gail Deary, who was a wide receiver for the Women's Professional Football League um, football team, the New York Phillies, the same league that our own Judy Jancourt played in with the Toledo Troopers in 1985. So there's that. Um, so although Title IX um, supposedly guaranteed equal access for opportunities, women had to continue to push their way through the door. Um, in our exhibit, we tell the story of the 1976 women's crew team who staged a demonstration that helped define the Title IX movement. At that time, the team had to use the men's locker room and they had to wait until the men were finished showering before they could go in. Um, their protest drew national attention and forced Yale to quickly add a women's locker room. In 1988, female athletes from Temple University won a lawsuit to require colleges to comply with Title IX. This was the first case that held colleges and universities accountable for compliance to Title IX. Um, and the fight certainly continues today. And I know that Sheila's got stories of how she had to work through barriers. So I'm going to turn it over, but thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, Sue. Okay, so here we go. The stories from Sheila Mish. Um, and I want to, I also want to encourage that this, this is a dialogue, this is a discussion. Sheila has just an enormous wealth of incredible stories. Um, we're only gonna scratch the surface today, but if there's anything that sort of stands out, please feel free to um, raise your little icon hand in the Zoom or uh, put it in the chat um, or just, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, we'll make sure to get any of those questions or comments in uh, while we're all here. Um, so I wanna keep this uh, informative, but casual at the same time um, so that we can all really enjoy these stories. So who is Sheila Mish? Let me give you, let me give you a brief bio. All right. So she's a lifelong athlete and coach. As a young girl, as a, as a young woman, Sheila was involved in judo, which was taught by her father and inductee into the Wisconsin Judo Hall of Fame. Um, she did track, synchronized swimming, gymnastics, I'm not done, cheerleading, field hockey, field hockey under coach Nancy Page, for those of you who might be familiar with that name in this area. While she was a student at UWSP, she competed and received MVP status in both track and field hockey and was named UWSP Athlete of the Year. She received her graduate degree in physical education and health and taught and coached in high schools before becoming assistant track coach at UW Whitewater. In 1987, she took the senior lecturer position at UWSP and was the assistant track coach until she was named the head coach of the new women's soccer team where she co coached for 25 seasons. She maintained an incredibly rigorous schedule being a parent of two boys, teaching at 0.75 FTE, so at least three classes every semester and all that goes with that, while also coaching those two sports and traveling um, without a full-time uh, assistant coach. In 2012, Sheila was the first woman inducted into the Wisconsin Soccer Coaches Hall of Fame. Um, she is a beloved mentor to many athletes. She is a wife, mother of two sons and a grandmother. And today she joins us from Florida to talk through her early years as a female athlete and the challenges and successes she experienced in her history with sports. Thank you so much for joining us, Sheila. Take it away. Give us a little bit of insight into young Sheila in central Wisconsin and uh, your experience in sports. Well, thank you. Um, thank you to everyone uh, for just allowing me to come on and 
talk about my experiences as a child and all the way up till actually now. So thank you so much, Community Foundation. Um, I want to talk about the 60s, if I can go there first, because I think people want to know, the question always is, why did you love athletics so much at an early age? And I want to go through those experiences. So put yourself back in the 60s, those of you that can remember that generation. <laughs> Um, as a child, I had lots of opportunities and I had a lot of role models. And I, you know, I love putting this speech together because I got to think about a lot of people and I got to talk to a lot of different people. I went to my class reunion um, for the fifth year class reunion and I had a discussion with so many of the people that got to um, go to elementary school with me, junior high, high school, college you know, people, and we just talked about all these wonderful experiences. So let me talk about my father. We, growing up in Wausau, Wisconsin, in the 60s, uh, we had a home, and in the basement, we had a dojo, which is a gym where you practice judo. So we had a lot of people come into our home. Now, my father, his influence for athletics was wonderful because there was no gender differences. There was no age differences um, I would compete against men. And, you know, I was seven, eight years old. I would compete against women. Women, I didn't know the difference. So he really taught me to respect everyone and that anyone that's done any judo knows that it's not so much about strength. It's about balance. So anyone can do that. Um, I remember something um, very vividly. I was very sad when my mother and father and brother were in the car and we would drop my brother and my father off at the YMCA, Young Men's Christian Association. And it was only for men in the early 60s. And I would always ask my mother and father, why can't I go in there and play? Why can't I do judo? And they would say it's only for men. But soon enough, my dad was on the board, you know, in Wausau and they created the YMCA for everyone. And I basically hung out at that YMCA, I would ride my bike down there, hang out every day. I would, um, you know, play in the gym. We would do competition. We would climb the ropes. You could get there the fastest and ring the bell. And so I'm thinking, this is really, really fun. And, and I'm not too bad at this. But the YMCA was a big part of my development. Um, another thing, in elementary school, I don't, and some of you might remember this, uh, Chubby Checker, the twist, we would have competition out in the parking lot once a week, and it would, who could do the twist the best, the fastest, and I remember wanting to be so competitive, I wouldn't even sleep the night before because I thought it was the coolest thing in the world, and they would make these little trophies, and I would always try to get that trophy. That gave me a great appreciation for wanting to compete. We had a fifth grade male math teacher at Grant School. And me and my two friends, best friends, we were very competitive, very athletic. And he said, you know, we, you got to get your energy out, girls. I'll never forget that. And so he created three baseball teams, softball teams, baseball teams. And then he lined up everyone in the three classes on a line and said, okay, pick your teams. Now, that was the first time that I thought about wow, we're going to make people feel bad. This is competition. I have to pick my team members. And my cousin was on that line and different people that, you know, I really didn't want to, on my team. But that was another real difference for me as far as being an individual. Like in judo, it seemed like I was an individual competitor. This was a team sport. Well, the three of us were friends, but after that softball competition, we almost became enemies because we didn't know how to get our, our competitive spirit out in a positive way. It became very negative because we really were out to beat each other. But that was my first lesson in a team sport. Another lesson that I had was um, the presidential physical fitness testing in fifth and sixth grade. And for most of you that know, it was President Kennedy that put together a, uh, a test that was five components of fitness. And it was, it was fun for me doing the agility test, the mile run. And it was the first time that I ever got to compete um, in a sport that I really thought I was going to love. And so that was another uh, program that we loved. Track meets in fifth and sixth grade. We went down to Tom Field in Wausau and the boys and girls ran together. Boys were in the 600 meter, girls were in the 600 meter. And 
and it was just fun. We didn't really know the difference that, you know, was there were going to be girls competition and boys competition. But I remember really putting a lot of effort into that. Now I'm going to move to junior high. And in junior high, uh, we had uh, GAA, Girls Athletic Association. So we did sort of like an intramural competition after school. We had uh, synchronized swimming that I participated in, but it wasn't competitive. It was just putting on a show at the end of the year. Also did the cheerleading, which I learned a great deal of from because cheerleading was the thing to do back in the day if you were an athlete. You know, you learn to be um, in front of an audience and you learn to have confidence. You learn to have to put out your skills in front of people because cheerleading is a lot of dance and skill. That's when I started to, to enjoy dance and enjoy the movements systems and doing things with my body. And I love that. So if you put all that together, you know, you put track and field and you put dance and you put cheerleading and you put synchronized swimming and you put judo, you really have a pretty good background. So I look back and I say, you know, I, I'm pretty appreciative of some of the opportunities that I got to do. So now I'm going to move to high school. And if you want to ask more questions about high school, um, please, please ask from the audience, because I was fortunate enough to go to Wassa West High School when it opened. Now, this is my sophomore year was the first year that I got to attend, even though it's a four year school. So in 1971, when you walked into that school, we had a brand new state of the art track, beautiful track. And I was so excited. And and at that time, the only thing they really offered for girls was that competitive track that I can remember. Now, we did intramurals and then um, and we did some competition but I don't remember doing, you know, a lot of competition. But then the summer of my junior year is when Title IX um, was initiated. So that was 1972. So 73 was my senior year. So senior year, I remember all of a sudden things started to change. Um, we no longer, we had, you know, in 71, we took the, the car to the state tournament, the state the state um, track and field meet, I'll say tournament because I was a coach for soccer. So sometimes it gets confusing, the state meet. And then in 73, I remember one time, now I don't remember how many times I was on a bus, but we did get to go on a bus. Um, but we, in 71, you know, we wore these one piece track, track and field outfits. They were just blue, you know, and it was just, it was like nylon. It was, it was really gross looking. And by the time, Title IX came around our senior year, then we did get uniform. So it was pretty exciting. But when I look back, I don't remember somebody saying, oh, hey, girls, you know, it's Title IX has just been uh, a, a real catalyst for you. I don't remember that exactly, but I do remember the, the subtle changes. Also, in my senior year, they added uh, basketball, girls basketball as a sport, and they added girls volleyball and girls gymnastics. So we had four sports that were offered. And I chose to do gymnastics because I was excited about doing everything I could. I chose to do gymnastics. I wasn't very good at it, didn't have a background, but I was a vaulter. I just wanted to participate like everyone else. We would just get together in the classroom and go, what are you gonna participate in? What are you gonna do? And there wasn't, a lot of us didn't have a lot of background, but just to be able to be a participant was a really, really cool option for us. Um, I remember, and I tell people this, the track meets in 1973, I can remember an individual running the first mile at that track meet. And she was from Parkside. I can't remember her name. She did very well in the marathon as well that year. But when she finished the mile, the whole audience stood up and gave her a standing ovation. And everyone was like, wow. A female completed the mile in that track. Now, those little tracks, she had to go around for a long time. Um, I, I remember when I competed, how exhausted I would get because some of the things that we didn't have in the 70s, you know, this is the 70s, 73, we didn't know anything about nutrition. Um, I remember my father telling me, because he was watching boxing, to eat a steak before I competed at lunchtime. And I ate a steak and I got in the starting blocks and I couldn't move. I was like, I lost an event I should have won and I could not figure out why. 
And I had to self-discover those things myself. And my, my dad had knowledge, but we were all watching the media about the boxers eating protein. So funny things like that. I mean, we would, we would take honey and we would, we really didn't know what to eat. We just, just did what we could do. And I talked to a friend the other day and I said, well, what do you think about, you know, the seventies you were in track with me? And she goes, you know, she said, I just remember not having any pressure. And I said, no, you didn't have any pressure. And she said, yeah, we didn't have to worry about scholarships. We didn't have to worry about somebody in the stands watching us or judging us. And I, I said, yeah, my pressure was from within. I just wanted to win. But I thought that was a really good point. And then I talked to her husband, who was a football player and track and field athlete during the 70s. And I said, Tom, that's his name. I said, can you remember anything in the 70s where you had more privilege than the girls? I mean, can you, can you remember thinking that way, thinking anything about it? Or, and he goes, no, not really. And I said, well, did you get to go on a bus to, you know, from your sophomore year to your senior year? He goes, oh yeah, we went on buses. And I said, how about the state track meet? Did you have housing? He goes, well, we stayed in the dorms. And I said, did you get meals? He goes, yeah, we got meals. And I said, so did you get your cleats paid for? Did you get your, you know, for football jerseys and all that? Oh yeah, we got all that. And I was like, I don't, and I said to my friend Sharon, I said, we never got meal money. I mean, I remember going on a bus that one time, but we never stayed in housing anywhere. And I said, then I was talking about weightlifting because basically there were universal machines. We didn't even know anything about weights. And I said, did you guys lift weights? And they're like, well, we went in on the universal machines. And I said, did somebody coach you or teach you? Yeah, our coaches did. I was like, well, that's interesting because I don't even remember weights being something that we talked about. And then I said to my friend, I said, do we ever talk about mental health or the psychological aspects of, you know, playing our games or running an event? And she said, no, she goes, I don't think we ever, we just thought we were like, if we, we had to be tough. That's just, you, you gotta be tough. Like anything that, that hurt. I remember having shin splints so bad because I had these shoes. You've all seen my shoes because <laughs> they've been on the, uh, on display at foundation, or if you haven't seen them, then come on over and see them because they're pretty cool looking. Yeah, those are my shoes. You could take them and fold them into a ball. And I would, uh, those are my cleats actually, because we put um, spikes with a screwdriver. I can't remember what we used. We put the spikes in the shoes, but it was like wearing slippers. And I said to this particular coach, one the male coach, the only time I ever really didn't talk much to male coaches because I said, to my friend too, we didn't really see any of those coaches around that coached the males, did we? She goes, no, never. So I said, I, I'm really in a lot of pain. I have bumps on my on my shins and I, I just can't run. And he goes, well, you girls just don't run hard enough to get any injuries. Now, seriously, that's the only time I can remember anything really being negative said to me. I think it wasn't like all the coaches were like that. It was just this one particular coach and that just resonates in my mind all the time made me want to even work harder. Now, why did we get shin splints? Because we had to run in the hallways because it was the boys' time to use the facility, to use the, use the track. It wasn't the girls' time. So they got to use it. We would run on the hard surfaces. Um, our coaches, our, our coaches, we had three coaches, wonderful women. One was an educator um, and the other two were physical education. They were very progressive and wanted everything for us. Wonderful people. Did they have the knowledge? No. I mean, who did back then? We basically, they did the best they could coaching us, but if you wanted to be good at your sport, you had to do it on your own time. And my friend Sharon and I, we'd go down to the Newman track and we would run the evenings. We would, you know, I'd run around my block just to get better because I didn't like the feeling of running a 200 meter and then feeling like I was going to throw up after. There was just something I was learning inside my body that I, if I keep doing this, maybe I won't feel that way. And that's exactly how I learned to run back in the day. Sheila, so those are my high school experiences. Sheila, I'll stop there. Yeah, I just I just wanted to maybe go a bit more into that because um, obviously you had this leadership of these really enthusiastic, passionate uh, female coaches. But like you said, there was a pretty steep learning curve for a lot of the female athletes because of just limited access prior to some of these changes that were happening in the schools of these these new um, teams for women, young women, girls, et cetera. So was there a, like a sense of 
sisterhood or like big camaraderie built around the fact that the realization of if we're going to get good, if we're, if we're kind of competing with ourselves and we want to, we want to see that excellence, we're going to need to lean on ourselves and each other. Did you see a lot of that? Or was it just a lot of sort of individual discovery? That's an awesome question. There were very few of us. I, I would say I'm, I could count them on my hand that really wanted to get better and be athletic. Some people were just out for the sport to be out for the sport. So that was when I learned that not everyone wants to do what I want to do or what we want to do. So there were very few of us. And that's what we talked about at our 50th reunion. Like there's just, just some, you know, not, I think nowadays you're going to find, like, I look at my granddaughter, I mean, in swimming, she's nine and there is a lot of girls together and they're giving each other you know, claps on the hands and they're getting ready for the swim meets and it's changed so much and they work so hard and they have such great coaches and meets and opportunities. And that's not what we had, but we did have something. And, uh, you know, I look at my sister's five years older and she never got the opportunity to do athletics and she was a great athlete. So yeah, we did work, try to work hard together. Those that wanted to. Does anybody have any uh, questions? I saw that uh, Christine in the chat had um, asked, uh, did you, uh, did y'all know what to eat before races? And it sounds like that was also part of that self-teaching, self-discovery. So that maybe having a steak <laughs> prior to any sort of athletic event was avoided. Do you want me to talk about my college years at all? <laughs> Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think let's let's move on to yeah. As you're c continuing to build up um, your skills and your uh, competitiveness, um, the kinds of experiences that you were having there. Okay, I'll try to keep this shorter. Okay, 1973, I went to college and I competed in track and field, and then uh, my sophomore year, uh, Nancy Page recruited me out of the hallway. Um, to come play field hockey because she knew that I could run. And so that was something I played, knew nothing about, had an awesome time, great teammates, and uh, really appreciate to see the changes from my freshman year to my senior year. Uh, I think I'm going to, some of the, the most awesome experiences that I had in track and field was went to nationals. And I think it was, I don't know if it was my senior year or junior, went to the nationals in Denton, Texas at the Texas Women's University. And we drove down in a, um, in a car where we had six people. It was, uh, you know, it was, we were all cramped in there and we drove all the way down, got into a hotel. I can remember spiders in there and roaches, you know, crawling all over us. This is my visual. Then I looked out the window in the morning and I saw Olympians running by our window, Francie LaRue. I'm like, what the heck? Our meet doesn't start for two hours and she's out there training, running? Well, little did I know that in, you know, in this 1972, I want to say, no, 1970, I want to say, I want to say it was 1974, 1975, somewhere around there, that we were going to have Olympians that we had to run against because there was no division one, division two, or division three. And I mean, I got blown out of the blocks. I mean, I think they were already at the finish line by the time I got out of the blocks. Those were sprinters that were division one caliber. And records were being broken, but I had, I had no, we had no business being there. I mean, that was a, an, an awesome meet. Now in field hockey, we had so many different opportunities as well. We got to play against uh, Wisconsin Badgers, Ohio State, you know, some of the really big schools. So those opportunities to travel and see things were wonderful. But I mean, we, we didn't have, um, you know, we didn't have the same opportunities that they have today. And the same thing with my college athletes. When I coached, I started out as being a, you know, I was the driver. I had to drive in bands and um, it, I think, and I had to teach a lot. Like you said, I, I had to teach a lot and I, and we had, um, we had an okay budget, but not a great budget, but we did the best we could. We had, you know, sometimes terrible field conditions that got better through the years um, the difference now, um, so we're looking at what's going on in soccer over at the university. I had a part-time assistant coach. I don't think I, my assistant coach never made more than $2,000. And I, you know, they were full-time people working, you know, outside the community and 
then they had to come and coach. So, I mean, bless their heart. They were awesome. And they made my team better. Um, now you see, I just saw it like this week or was it last week that UWSP hired a full-time assistant women's soccer coach. So um, the equity is starting to happen and I'm very proud for that program. And I don't think they um, are teaching anymore as coaches. So they have released time to really get the job done and make the program better. So I'm um, very happy that that is happening now in 2024. So as you're reflecting uh, back on your uh, connection to the history of women in athletics in central Wisconsin and beyond, and also um, having been involved at the uh, opening of the Heritage Park exhibit, um, what what kind of comes to your mind? I know that you, um, when we've spoken before and even you've alluded to it in this conversation is that you just have a real desire to continue to champion, to celebrate all the successes, to really appreciate the experiences that you were, that you were a part of, um, that you helped to create rather than focus on any of the, um, any of the issues that you saw where that uh, inequity existed. So looking back on all of that and now, um, with Sue's work, John's work in, 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 um, uh, creating this beautiful exhibit, what really sparks in your mind um, as a participant in that history? Oh no, we lost your well, sound. I oh, just, no, I'm at awe that the group of people that put this, that put this together. I mean, in the amount of time, they called me two years before the exhibit began and wanted me to collect as much information as I could and, and, and artifacts and articles and, and everything. And it was just so much fun going through it all and so much respect for this group of people that they care about people from 50 years ago. And they, they, they want us to tell our story. And if you haven't been over to that exhibit, you have to get over there because it, you walk in and you're just like, Holy cow. I, it was very exciting for me to be a part of this. And uh, I haven't gotten my granddaughter to this yet, but, it's so fun to to just talk to her about the differences and we talk all the time and she just can't believe the differences in the opportunities that she has as a nine-year-old a swimmer in Orlando compared to what you know the opportunities we had but I said that's all we had and we didn't you know we didn't have the media we didn't have the articles we didn't have people seeing us at other people's times we didn't we didn't have that so just be so appreciative every single day of what you have and don't get tired of participating or having fun because I mean, I'm still very competitive in my Zumba classes, in my Latin cardio classes for myself that I'm going to work as hard as I can. That never goes away. So, um, yeah, I just, and just seeing teammates, you know, at the exhibit and people I haven't seen for some of them 50 years and getting together. It was like you never wanted to leave. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, I just want to acknowledge, uh, we have in the chat, uh, Judy Olson says, I remember Sheila as a student teacher in physical education at DC Everest in the Wausau area, a great role model oh, yeah. for young women. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, I do, I yeah, do find it lovely wow. um, being, uh, not being from this area, but just really relishing in the deep connections that folks in central Wisconsin have and the opportunity to come back and celebrate um, this area and the history of it uh, with something like this exhibit. So um, awesome. Well, we'll continue. If anybody has any questions or comments or uh, wants to extend the story with Sheila, uh, get on the chat or um, you can raise your um, hand in the Zoom or just speak up. But I do want to make sure that uh, we take time this hour to talk a little bit about the exhibit because that is something that you can experience right now. It's not going to be there um, uh, always. So this is a limited opportunity to really dive deep into the history of women's athletics in Portage County. Sue, um, would you come back on and give us a little bit of information about what it was to be a part of that committee that was curating all of this history, um, the discoveries you were making, and then bringing that to the public. Well, I'm happy to share. As you can tell from meeting Sheila, 
it's just been a, an absolute joy to meet all of these all of these fascinating women. I have thoroughly enjoyed myself. Um, Tim Siebert and I, we had just come off of working on the World War I project and a World War II project, and we weren't sure what was going to happen next. And a board member suggested it was um, that we look at Title IX since it was the upcoming 50-year celebration, and we really kind of seized on that. So our first meeting of our group was January of 2022 and pulled together some women that I knew um, and they all really dove in and made this project absolutely phenomenal, everybody's different context. So I, um, playing in the background are some scenes from, um, from the exhibit, but I wanna publicly thank Cherith Beavers, Jane Elliott, Colleen Gladusky, Shelley Johnson, my husband, Paul, um, Kitty Monk, of course, Tim Siebert, Lori Walters, and of course, thanks to John who supported us through this whole endeavor. Um, so when we first met, we sat in the downstairs of the synagogue and kind of looked at each other and said, oh, how do we get our arms around this whole project? And so we kind of started brainstorming and we knew that we would have to talk about we have five high schools in Portage County. We have we have Amherst, we have Almond Bancroft, we have Rosholt, we have Pacelli, and we have Spash. And we thought, all right, we're going to look at all the high school sports, and clearly we'll talk about teams and individuals. We know that we've got some fabulous trail trailblazing individuals. We've got a lot of championship teams. That's so cool. But then. As we started looking and thinking about this, we realized that it's really more than just the champions. It's the, it's the individual stories. It's the people like Sheila. It's the people like Nancy Page. It's it's the the amazing the the coaches, the both men and women who kind of helped along the way. It's it's been utterly inspiring to work on this. So I think for me, some of the most fun parts of the exhibit were we're going around and interviewing people and hearing their stories and getting an appreciation for how hard they worked and listening to Sheila it just makes me think about that as well how hard she worked to achieve what she did and the level of achievement is just awesome and of course there's I think I know you'd asked about maybe one of my favorite stories and it was one that um, a, a woman I met a long time ago that I worked with on the um, different community project, Mary Pachoka from Amherst. And she said, do you know the story of Kathy Pachoka? And I said, I have never heard of her. And she said, well, she was a wrestler in 1987. And she got me in touch with, with her parents and, and um, Kathy herself. What a great story. So here she is, 1987. She's one of four girls in the state who want to wrestle. And so of course, because there's no girls wrestling program, she has to wrestle boys. Now imagine how that went over. But her coach and her parents and her brothers were all very supportive you know, of her endeavor. They were all you know, big wrestler, wrestling proponents. So it's so cool. So here there's this little 98 pound girl and you know she, she has to get weighed in in the boys locker room in front of everybody, which of course, I mean, I guess where else would you do it? But uh, you know, there were, there were other teams and parents who were not, they were kind of um, caused a lot of, of grief for this poor girl. And she got, there she is. And she got her hair cut by a referee who thought her hair wasn't short enough. And as you can see in the picture, it looked pretty short. Um, but at any rate, it was a very, it was a very cool story. And she was not just, um, I'm gonna go out for wrestling because I think I wanna be part of it. She beat, she was the, one of five people who ever scored points against a five-time state champion. So she, she was quite an athlete herself. Oh, there was Sheila. So what you see running behind me is, um, just various images from our exhibit. You'll probably see some people that you recognize. Our exhibit is divided up into a little bit of history, 
We focus on our trailblazers, people like Sheila and Nancy, absolutely great stories. We focus on all of the different sports, not only the team sports through the high schools, but also club sports and individual sports. We have an area we um, where we talk about outstanding women. And this is women who um, made an impact on programs in our, in our community. And here I'm thinking about people like Jean Luchwager, or who's you know very involved in tennis, or Carrie Diamond, who got rugby going not only at the university, but also at SPASH. How cool is that? Um, it's just been, I think, the project of our heart. When we walked into this building, we said, what are we going to fill it with? And lo and behold, we filled it. So it's been totally great. And now, Sue, um, as an extension of this, you have uh, collected these histories, these stories, these trailblazers, um, and there is a book available. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Well, so as you can see, we have a lot of information that's in the exhibit on the different panels, but we weren't able to tell a fuller story, like, for example, Sheila's story. We couldn't put all of that information within the context of a panel. Um, so we we made the decision that our book was going to be a fuller interview and more detailed information about some of these individuals, as well as teams. When you have a community like uh, uh, Portage County that has 19 state softball champions, um, you have to tell the story. You have to tell the story of softball and you have to acknowledge those different teams. So the book um, has far more information um, than the exhibit, although the exhibit has a lot of information. I think if you're really interested in stories, I would highly recommend reading the book. I hope you'll enjoy it. Uh, how do how does one get a hold of that book? Where is it? Um, it's available at Heritage Park Bookstore. And I think, John, if you'll correct me, um, Fridays from 12 to 4 or Saturdays 10 to 2. And it's also available at Bound to Happen Books. Um, downtown. Brilliant. Yeah, let's go ahead and transition over to John to tell us a little bit more about that and then what's happening at Portage County Historical Society. Yeah, thanks for having me. Having me, my internet connection is a little unstable. I keep on getting a, like a warning. So sorry if I sound garbled. You're good. You're good. We sound, we hear you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So to, to kind of follow what Sue was saying. Um, so we're open uh, through the rest of summer on Fridays from noon to four and Saturdays from 10 to two. Um, and, and that's when you can get the book. The book, the book is called the same as the exhibit is uh, we just wanted to play the story of women's athletics in Portage County. Um, and that's a great companion to, to what's going on with the exhibit. Um, but that's not the only way that the exhibit's going to live on post uh, this summer. So um, the exhibit's been, the, that will conclude like a basically a two year run at the end of summer. So um, it's it's been up for a little while and you still have a couple months now to, to check it out. Um, but the ways that it's going to carry on is you saw in some of the slides that were running during uh, while Sue was talking uh, that we had uh, a, a great local guy named Barry Kalnan who does 3D imaging. He came in and uh, made a 3D image of the space as with the exhibit exhibit material up. Um, so there will be a virtual exhibit um, as well as um, there will be um, uh, that th you can go through that. And then the other really cool thing is what's called oral histories. And so um, if you're not familiar with what an oral history is, it's different than like an interview that you're going to do very specific. An oral history interview is meant to be a historical record of somebody's life. And so you can do it at any point in any person's life. And it's great way to um uh look back at, at where we've and and you know where different how different people have evolved and things like that um sheila was one of uh, the participants in the oral history project for this exhibit um so i think we've got eight or nine um and so when you come into the exhibit you can actually scan a qr code and while you're learning about janelle marville you can have janelle tell her story or sheila tell her story um and the really great thing about oral histories and getting these things uh, completed and what's be really apparent is how important they are. We've already lost two of the people who have given oral history interviews. Um, and so both Hall and, and Judy Jane have passed away since we've interviewed them. 
And so we're really fortunate to have got that uh, interview done um, so that their stories can live on as part of our archival holdings as well. Um, and that's just the start too. one of the, so that you could actually uh, basically utilize us as a service to do your own oral history projects with you or your loved ones. So it's been a transformation experience, not only from the content aspect of this project, but um, moving forward as an organization of our community better too. Awesome. There is a, a link in the chat um, that John has provided us uh, to take a glimpse of that project, those oral histories, um, and to learn a bit more there. Um, I also want to make sure that we uh, take, oh, Sue, did you have something that you wanted to say? Yes, I do. I think um, just very briefly, I forgot to acknowledge the tremendous contribution that UWSP has in the role in women's athletics when I was talking about um, the exhibit. And the reason I want to point this out is I think that the UWSP, the trailblazers and the, the women that participated, really their experience filtered down and impacted the um, the opportunities that are were available to all of our high schools. And so I, I think that without UWSP, I think that the story of women's athletics in Portage County would be a little different. So thank you to all of those trailblazers who really and UWSP athletes who really helped lead the way for our high school and younger girls. Yeah, I I, I really I want to pull that comment out uh, some more because I I have found um, it's it, that Wisconsin and particularly Central Wisconsin is is a pretty incredible place when you look at the histories and that that striving for gender equity across the board. Um, I think that there's just a lot of, um, there's a lot of will in this state in order uh, that, that where folks have seen, um, uh, of, ha have given foresight to what it means to have uh, gender equity um, in sports, in all areas, in industry and in business and family, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and what that does to um, these really vibrant uh, communities. And I think that Portage County is a, a big representation of the good that that does in terms of its economic development, in terms of its innovation, participation, et cetera. And having these colleges um, here uh, is, is a way that um, we're continuing to get in these um, new ideas and really grab hold on those new ideas and run with them. Um, I uh, wanna make sure, um, there was one question. Um, we're getting to the end to the, uh, of our hour, but Christine um, in the chat had asked Sheila, any problems transitioning between individual versus team competition? Um, if you're, are you talking as an athlete or a coach? But as an athlete, I absolutely loved having both the individual and the team because team. <laughs> you can be the best athlete on your team and you can lose and you need to know how to have good teamwork. And those are the lessons that we've learned along the way. And being an individual, you are responsible for yourself and how hard you work. And, you know, if you want to work harder or you want to get to that, that finish line before someone else, I mean, that's, that's all on you. Um, as a coach, um, coaching an individual sport versus a, and I did because I coached, um, track and field individual sport versus a team sport. I think there is a lot of differences and I truly loved coaching a team sport. It's really a joy to bring women together and teach them how to work together to win games. And, you know, the team building is amazing and you don't, really do too much team building as in an individual sport as much as a is a I mean I see what my granddaughter does in swimming but it's very very different than in a team um, the transition is easy I mean they're both uh, very important and they're both very fun awesome thank you for that question Christine um okay so we have a couple of things that we can all do uh, we can go see this exhibit in Heritage Park this summer uh, get there before Labor Day weekend. Um, those hours, again, are Fridays, noon to 4 p.m., and Saturdays, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. I've gone and was just blown away by that experience. You can also check out uh, the book by the same name, We Just Wanted to Play, and that's also available at the Heritage Park or through Bound to Happen Books. 
There's the oral histories um, that you can uh, get more information from that online through uh, the, the URL in the chat. I want to make sure that we uh, take a moment before we end today. Uh, John, what's happening um, What's happening at Portage County Historical Society as we look in the next few months? A whole lot. Um, so uh, we have a lot of events yet this summer. Um, so we uh, have a Point Brewery History Tour coming up Thursday. Um, we have a firehouse property in this point. Um, and so we have a thing called Firehouse Fridays, and that is like a kind of a community open house we do once a month in the summer and so we have a bluegrass group called the foragers this friday from five to seven um and then we're still uh a couple of tours that are coming up uh walking tours um are about to launch again soon as well as uh, if i can nail it down date we'll have a bike tour yet this year and uh just stay tuned for tours let me put it that way there's there's a lot more um end of things plus some programs that we'll have uh once fall We'll have like more like sit down uh, programs and things like that. And uh, right now, um, it, it it's kind of uh, the the start of the next cycle. Um, so as the women's athletics exhibit it is starting to wrap up, we start to look into the future into three and Portage County. Um, and so we're working on what that will look like and what the, what the title is going to be um, because the next one. So uh, if you would hear those different things. Uh, just send us a note on our contact form on our, our, our uh, on our website. Um, and then also, if you like want to know more about this stuff, first off, you can become a member. Um, but again, if you just fill out that contact form and say, I want to be added to the mailing list, uh, we'll keep you up to date on most of the stuff that's going on there too. Um, but uh, it's been really great to see how this exhibit is connected with the community and hopefully the next exhibit can do the same thing. Exciting. Uh, is uh, Facebook also a good way to stay connected with y'all? No, get on the newsletter. Absolutely. Okay, great. I'll go ahead and yep. put that up there as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but if you get on our mailing list, then you then you get everything in an email too. So that's a good yeah. thing. Yeah, brilliant. So everybody, we got to go to Heritage Park. You got to get the book. You got to sign up for the newsletter. Um, go to... Uh, see the foragers this Friday, um, lots going on. What an incredible organization. Um, I wanna um, thank you all so much uh, for your time today. Um, I wanna thank everybody, our community for coming, learning a little bit more about this project. Uh, one of many awesome things happening in Portage County. I'm feeling very lucky to be here. Um, and uh, so yeah, Sheila, Mish, thank you so much. Thank you for all of your work as a trailblazer, but also thank you just for your um, wonderful spirit and for uh, shining a light on some uh, very personal stories, uh, being an athlete and a coach here in central Wisconsin. Sue, I see you at all of the community events. You're incredibly um, engaged and I just wanna thank you for your time and care in bringing these stories to light. And John is a leader in our community um, to really be able to uh, get a sense of belongingness and inclusion as we look at um, from a historical point of view into the future. Um, I really, really appreciate all that you do for our community. We have um, our next community lunch hour is gonna be in August, like that's next month, August, crazy. <laughs> um, and that's going to be hosted by our very own Haying Vang at the Community uh, Community Foundation of Central Wisconsin. Um, so that's August 12th at noon, as usual. And it's a special 90-minute interactive workshop focused on integrating data into effective storytelling using data sets from PC Conduit. If you haven't used PC Conduit yet, get on, get registered. Um, it's a, an incredible tool in order to drive um, information for yourself, your organizations, and Kaying has the ex expertise to really uh, give us the knowledge of how to use that in our storytelling. All right, so we'll end it here. Thank you all very much. Have a great week. Maybe we'll see some sunshine at some point um, and we'll see you next month. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.